I'd like to acknowledge the fact that yesterday our workshop speaker did get held up at Canadian Customs and got turned back. And my co-organizer, Michael Shucker, stepped in, and I really want to thank him for doing a superb job on very short notice. Uh, I also wanted to thank Asmi Toomey for sending her slides on, because that was much appreciated, and we'll try and make it up to her. I didn't think Canadian Customs was going to be that rough on somebody coming to hockey analytics. <laughs> okay. uh, so Michael uh, and I will be around. Michael's part of the program. I'm local organizer. I've got some students here. Uh, I'm going to turn things over to our MC, Scott Cullen from TSN. Good morning, all. Um, now, I don't know if you, if you caught that, but Rob Volman does have a book for sale. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to get that out of the way now, because that's probably the last time it's getting mentioned today, Rob. I'm sorry. That's, uh, these are the rules. I don't make them. It's just the way they are. Um, okay, I, I, I've been to quite a few hockey analyst conferences and I enjoy it because I get to learn from the smart kids uh, and looking at the program here today, it looks like there will be a lot of learning to be done. Um, so let's get started. I'm going to be the, uh, the Tim Murray of MCs. I'm just going to pound it out. And here we go, Tim Swartz, uh, Professor of, um, of Statistics and Actuarial Science from Simon Fraser. So we've come a long way to get here. Uh, he says he watches all sports and plays some sports, but is not very good. On the flip side, he publishes lots of sports analytics papers, so he's in the right place. So, Tim, come on over. Thank you, Scott. And uh, my thanks to uh, Shirley Mills and uh, Michael Shuckers for inviting me. Uh, my talk today is on uh, pace of play in hockey. And uh, you'll see it's a very, very straightforward talk, but I, I think there's a, a nugget of an interesting uh, idea uh, here. This is uh, joint work with my former PhD student, uh, Rajitha Silva. Rajitha is um, now a professor in Sri Lanka, and this formed a very small part of his uh, PhD uh, thesis. Okay, so. Uh, When I go to statistics conferences these days, it, always there's talks on reproducibility. And if you haven't heard what reproducibility is, the, the issue with reproducibility, uh, reproducibility takes various forms. So the most egregious form of uh, lack of reproducibility is when you have an experimenter who uh, fudges the data, makes up the data, publishes the paper, and then at a later uh, time, some other researcher comes along and tries to replicate the, the results and is unable to do so because the, the data is wrong. Uh, clearly, that's, that's really bad. But there's subtler forms of uh, reproducibility. And one, one, one form is uh, called uh, publication bias. And so here's, here's the idea. Imagine that we're uh, investigating some new uh, naturopathic uh, medicine. And there's 100 labs in the world who are uh, taking, taking, uh, doing experiments on this, on this new uh, medicine. And let's say that maybe 10 of the labs find out that the, the uh, medicine is beneficial. So they publish their results. And then the other 90 labs, they're unable to publish their results. They didn't get a significant result. That's the uh, culture in publishing. You can only seem to publish if you have a significant result. So, um, what happens then is uh, people begin to believe that the, the drug, the, the medicine, is effective when really the, the, most of the evidence is that it's not. So that's in the experimental sciences. What, what does that have to do with uh, the mathematical sciences? So for, for example, imagine that um, on the one hand, if I'm, uh, if I'm trying to prove a theorem, a uh, mathematical theorem, and I'm unable to prove it, uh, can, can I write up a paper and publish it? Well, the answer is no, because the fact that I couldn't prove something isn't evidence that it can't be proved. It's just probably evidence that I wasn't uh, clever enough to uh, prove the theorem. However, um, there's a flip side to that. Um, sometimes there's good ideas out there, and uh, people work on these ideas, and then uh, they can't get anywhere, and then later on uh, somebody com else comes around and they work on the same idea. So there's a lot of wasted time. So there is some benefit in uh, publishing things that are negative results. 
And essentially, that's, that's the basis of what I'm going to talk to you about today. I, I've got a result that's negative. It didn't turn out the way uh, that I hoped it would turn out. Um, but I'm maybe hoping that one of you will uh, catch on to the idea, maybe see some flaw in what I've done, uh, do something else, and uh, come up with something uh, useful. All right. Uh, I wake up on, I've been watching lots of soccer over the years, and I wake up early Saturday mornings. I'm, I'm from BC, I'm on the West Coast, so I have to get up at 5 a.m. on Saturdays to watch uh, Premier League. And uh, I'm interested in uh, pace of play in hockey, and the, the inspiration comes from soccer. So I want to show you a, a, a little clip. And in this clip, if you listen closely, you'll hear the announcer uh, mention uh, pace. Okay, because I'm trying to. Uh, quantify what, what pace means. And uh, in, this, in this clip, this is taken from this summer. It's, it's a World Cup match uh, between uh, Mexico and Germany. Uh, this is the game where Mexico shreds Germany. They only win one nothing, but they, they could have won the game uh, four, four or five nothing. Uh, Mexico was very quick. And uh, what you'll see is Germany has the ball. Uh, they're going up the field. It's taken away, and then Mexico counterattacks and score. So let's, uh, let's uh, watch this uh, short clip. There's a real pace about Mexico when they come forward. Nicely done again. Here goes Hernandez. Taking on Martin. He's got support here from Lozano. Cuts it back inside. It's Lozano! It's 1-0 Mexico! My roots are German. Let's watch it once more. It's a lot of fun. Nicely done again. Here goes Hernandez. Taking on Martin. He's got support here from Lozano. Cuts it back inside. It's Lozano! It's 1-0 Mexico! And the man who's shot through the qualifiers has lit up the opening game in Group F. It's Javi Liz... Okay, now i got to sort of this thing. Let's see. Some trouble advancing the screen. Is the uh, what am I doing wrong? I'm just hitting the uh, page down. Yeah, if you find it. Oh man, I use a Mac. Uh, yeah. Let's see, page that down. That laptop is just funny. Page down. No, I hit page down. So uh, when I watch these games, uh, the English Premier League in particular, the, uh, the announcers have very colorful language. And like I said, I want to take this, I quantify, uh, I would like to define and quantify this notion of pace in hockey. And what I'm thinking, or what I, what I thought, was that pace is associated with scoring. High pace correlates with scoring. So that's. That's the motivation for, for what I've done. And uh, it's just not intuition. Uh, there's, there's some evidence in soccer that uh, pace does affect scoring. So I uh, produced this graph. This uh, data was taken from uh, a, a, an article long ago. And, and this sort of result has been confirmed in other studies as well. It's, it's, uh, what, we, what we have here is we have time along the horizontal axis. And on the uh, vertical axis, we have the uh, proportion of goals scored in a game. And these, these, uh, th this data was taken from uh, the highest level of uh, Dutch football. And the game is divided into six uh, segments. So the first 15 minutes of the game, the second 15 minutes of the game, and so on. And so what you can clearly see is the game goes on, the uh, goal scoring it rate is, is increasing. And the, the reason for that, for, for those of you who watch soccer, is uh, I believe that as, as the game goes on, uh, teams get tired, they, they tend to lose their defensive shape. And then there's another aspect to it, and that is uh, one team may be losing, and so they start taking chances. They're pre pressing up, they leave themselves weak at the back, the other team counters, and, and perhaps they score. So as the game goes on, uh, as the game gets stretched, as the game gets frantic, as pace increases, 
uh, goal scoring increases. Okay, now let's suppose that I could uh, define and uh, quantify pace in hockey. If I was able to do that, there would be a lot of really interesting questions to be asked. This is, these are the sorts of questions I wanted to ask. Um, does pace increase scoring? Uh, that, that's that's the, the main question. And for whom? Right? There's two teams. So uh, is, is it for the one team, the other team, or, or both teams? Does pace contribute to winning? If it does, then uh, you should play pacey. Um, how do you increase pace? That's kind of an interesting question because in order to play at pace, um, there's a bit of a dance going on. Uh, both teams have to, have to play that way. One team rushes up and the other team has to rush back. Okay, so how do you entice another team to play uh, in a pacey style? Which teams are pacey? Which players are pacey? Uh, has pace changed over the years? And then, uh, Kind of the, the interesting question to me, as, as a statistician, I like questions um, that deal with strategy. Are there strategic implications to playing with pace? And this might be a little bit similar to uh, the strategy of pulling one's goalie. You know, when you pull your goalie at the end of the game, uh, your, your rate of scoring goes up, but also the rate of scoring of the other team goes up. So maybe there's some trade-off in uh, playing, playing at pace. Okay, so uh, I've sort of given you uh, ideas of what I think about pace. Uh, here I'm going to quantify it. And uh, here's the hockey rink, and uh, I've got events occurring at uh, points A and B. And uh, what we have then is uh, a distance, an attacking distance on the ith event, and I've labeled that uh, DI. So, that distance, I suggest, is an attacking distance, and it's, uh, it tells us something about pace. When you wander aimlessly across the ice, or you perhaps go backwards, uh, to me that's not playing at pace. Pace corresponds to attacking distances uh, down the ice. Okay, so if you, if you buy that, then um, I'm able to define pace, and I've got a, a very nice data set from the company uh, Sport Logique. Uh, to all the games from the 2015-2016 season. We'll be hearing more about Sport Logique. And they have this really uh, great data set where events are measured uh, every 1.2 seconds on, on average. And what are events? Events are things like uh, a body check takes place, uh, maybe a shot is taken, uh, perhaps there's a, a, a whistle, uh, you know, things, things like that. Okay, so uh, I've got these events and events in a game, and during those end events, I can uh, I can uh, sum up the attacking distances, the DIs that are uh, that, that are accumulated during the game. So big D then is the total attacking distance. Uh, I divide that by T. T is the time of the game, and uh, using appropriate units, I come up with a measure uh, P1, that's our first measure of pace, and it's uh, attacking distance per <coughs> second. So attacking distance in feet per second. And you know, there are a few little adjustments that we made here. So for example, we didn't uh, consider uh, overtimes, we didn't consider power plays, so uh, we're not dividing by uh, the total number of minutes in the game, but the total number of minutes uh, adjusted by uh, uh, the lack of power plays and uh, over overtime. So that's my measure of pace. So I would, uh, I was expecting. Uh, my great hope was that pace would be correlated with goal scoring, as teams played pacier games. And this this pace is a uh, is a measure of uh, the properties of the game, the way that the game is played, not the way that a, a particular team plays, but the way that a game is played. I was thinking that pace would be positively correlated with scoring. And so I've got two plots here. The first plot is goals versus pace for every game in the season. And the second uh, plot is uh, shots on net versus pace for every game in the season. So let's look at the second plot because, uh, as everybody here knows, uh, goals are scored rarely in hockey, uh, whereas uh, shots are more common, and that, that was the uh, motivation for, for these old measures like uh, Corsi and Fenwick. 
And uh, what do we see? Uh, we see exactly what I wasn't expecting. I see that, uh, in fact, as pace increases, there seems to be a, a slight negative uh, correlation with uh, shots. And so that's not uh, what I was hoping for. And uh, you're probably sitting there saying to yourself, well, okay, so he measured pace that way. That's how he defined it. Uh, I would do something different. I can tell you we tried quite a few different measures of pace. So for example, um, we limited pace measurements to those attacking distances, DIs, that were only when a player uh, skated at sufficient speed. So that DI divided by TI greater than or equal to five feet. We considered uh, pace only taking, another measurement, we only considered pace as taking place between the blue lines because we felt that you know maybe once you're within the blue line you can take a shot. There's not really not that much point in you know just going going towards the net. Um, then there's a popular uh, measure that's used these days called zone entries. We also uh, counted those things. But I can tell you everything we tried, nothing came out uh, really positively uh, correlated with pace. So uh, that's, that's my disappointment. And um, I, I would like to say that uh, surprisingly, uh, we got this paper uh, published in the uh, Journal of Sports Analytics. So you can have a look there if, if you're interested. And uh, I, I like to thank the journal for being open-minded because the tradition is negative results don't typically get uh, published. OK, so um, what's the take-home message? I think. Uh, the take-home message for me is that uh, hockey is, is not soccer. And uh, what's going on in soccer, I think, for a large part, is players are getting tired. And in hockey, uh, you do get tired, but, you know, we have uh, uh, line changes. And uh, as the game wears on, uh, people know that the, the shifts become shorter. So essentially, everybody on the ice is not really, really tired. So. Um, I think that's something that, that, that's going on here. And uh, in conclusion, so uh, I was not able to uh, characterize pace in, in a meaningful way, in a way that correlated with shots or with goals, because that's what I wanted to see. And I, I asked this provocative question, uh, can you, maybe, maybe you can do something uh, better. And uh, more generally, um, that, you know, this is a problem that interests me very much. I'd like to be able to uh, define and quantify styles of play. Because if you, can, if you can quantify a style of play, a style of play that leads to beneficial results, then maybe teams should begin adopting that style. And I haven't seen uh, really any work on quantifying styles of play. So that's, that's the more general problem um, that I'm interested in. So I uh, told you very much at the very beginning that the uh, talk would be straightforward and uh, short, and it is. And so I just uh, say thank you very much. quick ones. Uh, have you thought about the idea of uh, not just pace of both teams, but the differential in pace? Yeah. So um, I, I think most of you heard that. Uh, he's interested in the, the pace of individual teams. So we have the pace for a game. And then what I can do is I can do a regression. I can uh, have, have pace for the game with a component on the right-hand side of the regression equation, the two components being team one and team two. So uh, we did that, okay. and okay. we weren't able to separate it in a in a way that was uh, gave us any interesting results. Darn. Yeah. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. The second part of the question, if I can ask it, is um, uh, damn. <laughs> uh, is, I guess that was the other thing. Is there a way of measuring the space available to the person that's leading the pace? 
So the, basically, in essence, like if you're the goalie, is there anybody between me and you? Like, what's the the, the path I have to get through? So uh, there's kind of two data sets that are available these days that are considered big data sets. There's event data, that's the data that I have. And then there's player tracking data. Player tracking data has the X and Y coordinates of every player at all times during the game, or measured very, very frequently. Yeah. Um, I don't have access to that data. Uh, Sport Logic, last time I talked to them, they said they're working on that. But uh, I don't know if that's yet available in hockey, the uh, player tracking data. Player tracking data is available in soccer, and it's also available in uh, the NBA. If you're one of the privileged few to get those data sets, and of course the space and the size of the field as well, right? Eh? Yeah, that, that would come into play. Yes. Thank you. Do you have any idea um, about the length of time on the ice for the players that were in the in the burst of speed, and whether that might have had a correlation? Uh huh. Uh, okay, that's that's a good question. Uh, didn't look at that one. So you looked at the idea of how pace correlates to scoring, but have yes. you looked at taking a different path, like pace correlating to zone entries correlating to scoring? Okay, so um, we, we looked, uh, we defined pace in terms of zone entries. And uh, so looked at uh, counted zone entries and related it to, and, and regressed it against scoring. And again, uh, correlation was, I'm not saying it was negative in all cases, but it was it was never strong. I never got a correlation of 0.8 or 0.9. Uh, so first, uh, back to soccer, it sounds a bit counterintuitive that you say as the players get more tired, the pace increases because pace implies speed and velocity, and the tired players are s slower. Yeah, that, it's it, more about maybe. Just like one of the previous uh, questions was, it's about opening more spaces between the players. Well, uh, I, th I think what goes on is uh, a player gets the ball, they have energy to attack. You always have energy to attack, and then they got to get back on defense, and they got no energy for that. So uh, that's sort of what, what is happening, I think, when players get tired. The defense loses their shape. Uh, they don't have a straight back line. Uh, but I, I see that counterintuitive comment that you made. And that, so when you were measured distance, you measured uh, it completely horizontally. Maybe uh, it would be more beneficial to measure the distance to goal change? Distance to goal. Okay, yeah. Never tried that. Uh, it's an idea. Uh, and the last thing is that the, the style issue that you talk So I come from chess background. Mm -hmm. So it's just. Whatever fits the ball, because the, in chess there are tremendous players of all styles. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you've got a roster that fits one style, but sometimes there is a roster that fits another style, and it's, it's, it's winning if, if the players fit. So okay. what, what kind of styles are, are you describing? Uh, well, it could be a more risky, fast paced style, maybe more squeezing style. In, okay. in, any, in any sport, we, we see it in, 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 in soccer with. Germany having very specific style, having tremendous success with it over the years, and Brazil, something like completely opposite. Okay, well, there's people here who probably know better than me, but to my knowledge, there has been no uh, measurements of style. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a good area of research, I think. Thank you. Okay, so uh, basically I have two questions. First is, have you tried to model the changing pace? That I think the pace may not contribute to win, but the changing pace from slow pace to fast pace, that may have something to do with winning. And uh, another thing I think is, uh, yes, and uh, is to measure the pace when the attackers changes, like it's for, for example, in the video, we could see that at the beginning, the Germans, they attack, and then suddenly the Mexicans, they get the control of the ball, and they attack back with a very fast pace attack. So uh, maybe the fast pace is only contributed to win when there's a change in the attackers in the game. 
that could be another point. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't really have a question, just more of a general comment. Um, I think there's another factor at play when you're looking at soccer, which is uh, you mentioned that pace goes up as players get more tired as the game goes on. But also in soccer, you have substitutions where teams are you know, subbing off a defender, bringing on an attacker. So I think that could possibly contribute to the, the increase in pace of play, whereas you don't necessarily see that in, in hockey where teams are and maybe they should be looking at doing this where it's later in the game and they bring on a fourth forward, take off defenseman. It's, you know, that's, that's one other factor that may be contributing. Okay, sure. Uh, of course, in soccer, there's only, uh, there's a maximum of three substitutions and there's play, 11 players on the field. So I don't know if that would affect the overall pace all that much, but maybe. Faster pace here. <laughs> uh, wondering if you ever looked at uh, any other measures of pace in terms of the directionality, like um, just either total speed or east-west speed, because in hockey, like side-to-side -side movement can often uh, make the goaltender reposition and and, uh, and sort of lead to uh, increased score chances. Yeah, we didn't write that up in the paper, but we uh, we fiddled with that initially, and again, uh, you know, no correlation. Uh, did you look at pace um, as it relates to possession? Uh, for example, dumping the puck in at the red line would give you a high pace of play uh, versus passing cross ice to a teammate would give you a slow pace but still keep possession. Yeah, so uh, for us, uh, back, back on that uh, picture of the hockey rink, uh, the A and B, those, uh, the uh, passage of play for the ith event was a passage where possession was retained. So we, we did account for it that way. So if you dump the puck in and you, you, gain, you, you have possession, then we consider that a pace contribution. But if you lose, lose it, then, then there's no pace contribution. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering if you took a look at different line combinations as like a traditional like first line versus sort of role players on the fourth line, or do you took a look at like Vegas and how they don't really have the traditional four line set up? Uh, no, we didn't do that. Uh, we did try lots of things, like we looked at pace in the different periods and thinking that maybe things change over time. We tried a lot of different things because it really, it surprised me. I, I, I really expected <laughs> high pace games to uh, contribute to scoring. Is that it? All right. <laughs> Thank you, Tim.